The anti-corruption war of President Muhammad Buhari for some has been partially successful and for others an unsuccessful crusade. Today we assess the President's administration's fight against corruption in 2021. And again, Nigeria announces the removal of fuel subsidy, but this time with a 5,000 Naira transport monthly grant. Are Nigerians ready to accept this new move? Well, this is Plus Politics. I am Mary Anoko. Now, during the campaign season of the 2015 general elections, President Muhammad Buhari vowed to fight corruption if Nigerians elected him to lead them for the next four years. He, when he was sworn in, he further declared a war on corruption. However, things are not going so smoothly. In a recent review, a former Nigeria head of state, Ibrahim Babangida, stated that corruption is Buhari's administration or in Buhari's administration is worse than when he, Babangida, was in government. Even the United States described the scale of corruption in Nigeria under President Muhammad Buhari's administration as massive and widespread. Many Nigerians believe that double standards in Buhari's treatment of those loyal to him also characterized the fight. Nevertheless, Abubakar Malami, Attorney General of the Federation, has a different view on this, as he has stated that Nigeria is getting it right in the fight against corruption under the Bahari administration. Well, joining us to break this down is Debo Adeniro. He is the Chairman Center for Anti-Corruption and Open Leadership, CACO. And we're also being joined by Kalawali Uluadari. He's the Deputy Director of SERAP. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you for having us. Thank you. So I'm going to start with you, Mr. Adeniro. Um, it's interesting when we see the different sides and the different, um, you know, prisms to which people look at the fight against corruption. Many have said that the president is doing well. Many have said that corruption is fighting back and others do not see anything tangible that the president has done in his fight against corruption. I remember very well when the president said that one of the reasons, um, or one of the biggest things he was going to deal with is um, corruption. Uh, we know that he, f he rolled on the wings of this to become president. But the president is uh, just about a year and a few months away from leaving office. How do you score Mr. President and what would be the um, you know, points for which you would score him? Thank you very much. I will score the president 70% in the fight against corruption. Um, you see, fighting corruption is not a tea party. It's a difficult task for anybody in any country of the world, no matter how powerful, no matter how developed the countries are. Um, corruption can be very tricky uh, when it comes to avoiding the long harm of the law. And uh, you also know that corruption crimes are not committed in the open. And uh, that means that a lot of efforts will have to be put in place to trace the evidence of corruption. And uh, witnesses of corruption also are not easy to come by. You need a lot of persuasion to get people into uh, uh, giving evidence against corrupt elements. And you also know that corruption has pervaded our crimes for a very long time and like it, 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 it was almost like a state policy in some, I mean, uh, at some level. And people thought sometimes ago that Corruption is actually a native of Nigeria. And if something has uh, become, you know, uh, something like a state art in a, in a country, and a lot of public officials and, and uh, even private sector practitioners have gotten themselves used into committing corruption crimes, 
it take it it is likely to take a long time and a lot of effort into uh, fighting corruption, into extracting corruption virus from the system that has gotten itself used to committing corruption crimes and getting away with it. And uh, of course, corruption didn't just start in the, during the present civilian dis dispensation. It has started since a very long time, even uh, even before the uh, independence in 1960 uh, and all of that. And even in colonial days, you, I mean, there are trappings of serious corruption. But then, if a, if a, if an administration is uh, opaque, you are not likely to detect corruption crimes. If an administration enjoys impunity, you are not likely to get justice against those who committed corruption crimes. If an administration is like a diaspora, you are not likely to uh, consider the losses that people have to suffer in the hands of corrupt elements. And that is the reason why it takes so long before corruption uh, efforts could manifest. And you also know that it is the same set of people, the politicians, the, the political elites, the ruling elites that are committing corruption crimes. And because we cannot do any other thing than to follow the law, the constitution that um, is grown norm for the administration of the country, we have to obey the law in tackling corruption. And okay. because it is the same politician that will pretend to be making laws that will curb corruption, they will not commit their all into making such laws. And that is also the reason why we have weak laws and weak implementation of those laws. And okay. it affects all arms of government, all tiers of government. And that is why we are having it so difficult to deal with corruption issues. But then the Buhari administration has done so much by implementing all of those uh, machinery, legal machineries that has been, uh, that, uh, I mean, that has been on the ground before it came in 2015. And his, um, his uh, political will. I'm, I'm, I'm really, I, I was really hoping that you would land so that I would ask you because you can't just tell me that the president has scored 70%. But you cannot tell me exactly what he did to get that 70%. Uh, and you're saying machineries. What machineries can we really point to this, that, and that that he's done to plug the loopholes in fighting corruption or to see that he has fought corruption to a certain level where we can, we can actually clearly say that this 70% stands? So I'm really hoping you can tell me that quickly. That's exactly what I'm going to that, okay, there are a number of safeguards, uh, legi uh, what do you call it, legislations that have been lying fallow over the years that were not operationalized by the previous administration. The, I mean, look at what has happened with BVN. Look at what has happened with TSA and a number of other legislations but that these, have But these are things that were already initiated by the Jonathan administration. Can we really that give credit exactly to the what president? what I'm saying that it has always been there. But there hadn't been political will to operationalize it. It, was during, it is during this administration that the BVN was fully implemented. And that has uh, made it difficult for corrupt elements to uh, launder money to launder illicit uh, process of corruption through uh, uh, financial institutions. The same thing with the TSA. In the olden days, I mean, before the TSA was um, uh, put in operation, several MDAs would open account in the name of the federal government, and they, they could open it in their own name, append their signatures, and whatever revenue that got into such account we go into private pocket. Then when you look at uh, Act 2, you know, uh, uh, anti-corruption and transparency units that ought to have uh, been domiciled with um, um, ICPC. Act 2, uh, ICPC on Act 2 should have at least a desk in all the MDAs 
so that they monitor the inflow and outflow of funds into those MDAs. Okay. That also didn't work for so long. Then Skumul also had made it difficult for professional bodies, for NGOs like ours, so civil society organizations, and so on and so forth, to launder money on behalf of corrupt elements. And if this is fully implemented, all of these uh, uh, legislations are fully implemented, okay. it will be difficult, if not impossible, uh, okay. for anybody to commit corruption crimes. So implementing those laws has made the, uh, the Buhari administration stand out above his predecessors. All right, I'll come back to you because I have so many questions, but I want to throw it to uh, Kalawale. Um, I know that Serap has come up with so many issues. They have taken governments, um, ministries, departments, agencies to court on several issues bordering on corruption, um, you know, um, disobedience to the rule of law. So I want to throw the same question I threw to him to you. How well has this government done in terms of fighting corruption being the bedrock of this administration's, um, you know, the reason why they became, uh, you know, the, the, the leaders of this country? They rode on the wings of this. How well has the presidency done? He's saying it's 70 percent and mostly he's pointed to, you know, finances, plugging a few loopholes from what he says. But I'd like to hear from you, Kalawali. Um, thank you very much. Of course, I have a different opinion. And the facts and the indices of this assessment bear that out. So if we are going to look at and assess the Bwari administration for the past six years, we should not do it politically like we've seen the proponents of this administration do. It's not a relative task compared to what has been before or previous administrations. It should be objective based on why the worldwide international best practice acceptable parameters and indicators. So we can look at, um, uh, particularly for an administration that come into power on the mantra of fighting corruption. So uh, I would look at it, for instance, we can start with the rule of law and due process uh, for this administration. How has that fared? And I think we can all agree that you cannot fight corruption or have, a, have any kind of fight against corruption without the rule of law. Due process is an integral part of fighting corruption within the confines of the rule of law. And so this administration has a penchant for picking and choosing which judgments it enforces or obeys. That is if it does at all. And that speaks to what we do at Sarah. Uh, presently, we have more than eight cases, judgments, by the way, I beg your pardon, against this administration, against the government. You know, some of them were gotten before this administration came, and some during the life of this administration that had yet to be enforced. And you look at this, these are judgments that speak to the basis of transparency and accountability. For instance, the president, during the broadcast that was uh, the interview with channels, uh, the issue of the, uh, over $15 billion spent on the power sector came up. Uh, you recall that Sarah had gotten a judgment from the Federal High Court, Honorable Justice Obi also, uh, ordering uh, the Bari administration to probe those allegations and if anybody is found culpable um, to face justice, including a recovery of these funds. Uh, this judgment is yet to be enforced, obeyed by this government. And still on the, the, the process and the rule of law, um, what about uh, the Auditor General's report that come out time and again? making the damning allegations against ministries, public and agencies for things that have transpired since 2015, including a huge amount of money that could not be accounted for. And this is within the context of an Auditor General that is appointed by the same president. What about enforcement of the Freedom of Information Act? How, how open is government? And a case in point is the Pandora Papers, for instance. These allegations are there in the open. What has this administration done about it? the allegations made against public officers who have been found culpable in this act? The least one would expect is um, the, the president, you would agree with me that the box stops at his table, to order investigation into these allegations. That's the least he could do. And then the second is this if you, uh, that we would use to assess the, uh, this administration is transparency and accountability. How transparent is governance under the Bwari administration? It, it is not, and, and, that, and that is just a fact. And again, you would agree with me that you cannot fight corruption without setting a good precedent. And transparency and accountability is an integral part of our constitutional provisions and our civil practices worldwide. 
For instance, security votes is an issue. Uh, those, uh, this amount of money is still being paid uh, to all, nearly all tiers of government. The president has done nothing about it, either to stop it or even to other investigations into how those funds have been utilized over the years. And you will understand that security votes is also part of the, uh, the elements of political corruption, uh, funding security and all this uh, political corruption. And then the budget processes. It is not enough uh, to to sign the budget within the cycle, within the January to December cycle, which is good, and but that is not enough actually. But it's not enough. What about our budget processes? Implementation of the budget. Is it being monitored? Uh, what about the releases? Uh, nearly every agency of government, including the anti-corruption agencies, will tell you that they do not have enough funds. And this is within the context of over 26 billion that's been allocated to the presidency and the vice president's office to travels and various uh, frivolous expenditures when very as very important aspects of, uh, of the economy uh, has not been taken care of. And so it, it, it doesn't look good. And then the thought will be to look at the legal framework uh, of uh, fighting corruption. You would think that the easiest thing that the administration would have done is to push through a lot of very credible uh, legislations that were for fighting corruption. We are, we are not yet we are yet to see that. But then the we but, but, but then we've also seen that I mean we've seen the presidency respond over and over saying that corruption is fighting back and that's why um, as much as they are willing, uh, it's difficult to also get to the legislature to you know fall in line and do the the, the needful. So. Again, is corruption, the fight against corruption, a fight that just the presidency can actually achieve? Now, that, you, you need to understand. And the president himself did mention it in an interview that he granted to channels yesterday. He, 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 the, the APC government is in the majority. Uh, the, 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 the preside over the two, as in the, the two legislative arms that comprise the National Assembly. And so ultimately, it's about the Buhari administration and it's ultimately about the political party uh, that are brought in um, to power. So it, it wouldn't be a problem. Uh, the, if the president can sign the 2022 appropriation bill into, into law and make it, even though with his reservations, why wouldn't he, for instance, have made sure either by executive bill or through his political party, the process of kind bill could have been passed? And you would understand the importance of that bill um, in the fight against corruption. What about any kind of whistleblower legislation? Again, we are yet to see that materialize. What about the audit bill that would empower the Auditor General to do more and guarantee him um, tenure of office? That is yet to have been passed. Even the Electoral Act that was amended and put before him that has cogent uh, provisions that would be able to fight corruption, uh, political corruption at that, was not uh, was not sustained by the president. So would you say there is political, political will at all in this administration to fight corruption? I disagree. I, I, I don't think so. Hmm. Interesting. I'm going to come back to you, Kola, but let me go back to uh, Mr. Deniro. Um, there are people who have said that this fight against um, corruption in under the Bahari administration has been deeply politicized. They've made cases as to those who are being you know, arrested or are called to question by the EFCC as those who are opponents, those who have spoken against the presidencies, um, you know, either um, their moves or their administration in general, those who have one way or the other criticized the president. Some have even questioned some of the um, people that the president has appointed. In fact, some people have said that the president continues to appoint people, even those who have questionable characters or questionable backgrounds, into office. Uh, they continue to shield their allies um, from investigations and, um, you know, some form of um, prosecution. In fact, they've also pointed out the president's disinterest in how the ruling party funds its election campaigns. And this is one of the things that Sarah is still in court uh, about, election finances being made um, public. What do you have to say about this? Well, um, I am not uh, a spokesperson for the president. Neither am I a, spoke a spokesperson for the ruling party. I'm speaking based on my observation and based on comparative analysis with other uh, regimes before, uh, I mean, other administrations before Buhari's. Um, yes, there are a number of shortcomings, especially when it has to be, I mean, when uh, things that have to do with uh, administrative uh, protocols. Um, uh, but one thing we should do is to be circumspect 
in our criticism of the administration. Uh, first and foremost, we I mentioned the other time that we have to follow the letters of the Constitution in any um, uh, analysis that we want to do about how well or otherwise that the government has performed. Um, to do that means that we have to look at where we are coming from. We, uh, the president necessarily have to work within a political party. And the political party has some influence over decisions that are made by the president. The president cannot single-handedly uh, decide on a policy crystallize the policy, implement it, and make sure uh, and ensure that it is uh, uh, implemented to the letter. Uh, campaign promises are actually different from administrative uh, policies. When you get to, I mean, the podium for campaign, you speak to the yearnings of the people, but you know that it is not only the executive that constitutes a government. You still have the legislature to contend with. You still have the judiciary to pass through. And a situation whereby you mean well, and you have a legislature that is not cooperative, what do you do? You act within the available space that you, you are, are free to ask. If every, every our, our righteousness is even fulfilled, and the judiciary says no. There's little the executive can do to uh, uh, assert itself. And that is why we are uh, saying that we need to change the Constitution, several aspects of it. Because if anybody operates under this constitution, it's not likely to go to the Eldorado of his own good intention, if he has any. I believe that the president actually intends to leave his footprint on the sand of time, especially as far as uh, uh, anti-corruption effort is I'm, cu I'm curious if the but president is indeed if the president is indeed ready and willing and this has always been uh, I'm, I'm speaking here as you know just following what you're saying has yes. really indeed wanted to change you know the fortunes of this country he should be in the forefront of pushing for a constitutional um, amendment or a, a constitutional conference or whatever you know they want it to be but that's not the case what we saw was a shabby thing that was an amendment of sorts where ma members of the National Assembly just, you know, had a tea party and decided whatever they wanted to. If the president really wanted to do this, don't forget the APC and of course, led by Mr. President, when they decided to run for office, they said they were going to bring us change. How much of that change has the president brought to us? Again, the, the number of people who are the majority in the National Assembly are members of the APC, the same party that promised to bring us change in this country. So, yes, according to you, the president does mean well, but does meaning well, or is meaning well enough a reason for the person to be able to bring that's change? What, because I can mean well, I, but then I might not really do well. That's what I'm driving at. I have told you that the president could mean well, but don't forget that it is the same politicians People say that uh, uh, all the political parties are more or less like the same in their program and agenda. And you also know the way that politicians migrate from one political party to the other. And that means that those who have committed corruption crimes will want a safe haven in the ruling party. And many of them will migrate to the ruling party. And when they but get But the there, president is the do? leader of the party. What if he was do? strict the and he followed through with his stance, the, would these people be the accepted into the party? If the APC really wanted the change, would they be opening the, their doors the, to these same people they campaigned against? Listen, you, you, are, you, you are the one talking. The president doesn't have all the powers to implement the rules. Even if 
he intends to do it. The president needed um, approval of the parliament. Don't forget that uh, uh, the ruling party is a coalition, a kind of uh, like uh, like uh, a granite coalition it, 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 that is not up to one year before they won the election. Now, these people, there are many of them who have gotten their, themselves used to committing corruption crimes with impunity. These people will not, they can only pretend to agree with the main thrust of the party program. Many of them will not want the fight against corruption to succeed, even when they are working with the president. Several of them have been uh, shown the way out. A couple of former governors are already behind the walls for corruption crimes. A couple of those who work with the present government are either being uh, investigated or already been tried and convicted. And okay. that some people migrated from their either to political party to the ruling party oh. has not shielded them from being investigated and being prosecuted. Okay. But like I said, the legislature has a role to play. If they don't play their role well, the president cannot impose his will on them. Okay. The same thing with the judiciary. A number of people... Are, uh, I think uh, we lost that connection, Mr. Mr. Deniro. Let me come back to Kola Walik. We, we're looking at solutions now because we, we're talking about, we've been talking about the problems. Um, but I want to quickly point out something that uh, Mr. Deniro said. He said something about the fact that corruption has become a native of Nigeria. And the question that cropped up in my head is why or how did corruption become a member of society so much so that it's so comfortable and seems not to want to go anywhere. Again, how do we go beyond this finger pointing thing? Because one, it's one thing to have an intention, it's another to have a plan. But from the look of things, it looks like um, the presidency, the APC did not necessarily have a plan as to how they were going to bring change to Nigeria. So going forward, we're already in campaign season. What should we be looking out for? Incidentally, contrary to what uh, Mr. Deniro said, and there are three, there are several legislations that have been passed at, by an APC. Um, Kalawale, can you hear me? Uh, apologies, I think we have lost uh, Kalawale. So quickly, uh, Mr. Deniro, I'm going to ask you this question, and I just want us to quickly uh, round up on it. Going forward, just as I asked Kala Wale, it looks like it's, uh, the presidency, the APC, did have good intentions, but then they did not necessarily have a plan. And we're in campaign season. Going forward, Nigerians are looking for a better deal. What should we be preparing ourselves for? Well, you see, the fight against corruption is for all of us. And uh, we should train ourselves to identify corruption. The whistleblower policy uh, of this present administration worked to some extent. And you know that there's hardly a way that you can operate within a party that has a preponderance of those who have been accused of corruption crimes in the past and succeed in fighting them. They will... Uh, pitch their tents against you, against the policies and the rest of them. But then you talk about finger pointing. There's no way we are not going to finger point those who have the opportunity of committing corruption crimes. Those are the people you said were in the past administration. Of course, it was those. It is those who were in the past administration that had the opportunity of deep, dipping their hands into the national till and helping themselves with our common patrimony. Okay. So that is why preponderance of those that have been tried and those who have uh, been government before. The same thing will happen. By the time this... What do we do going leaves, forward? I'm so sorry, uh, Mr. Denira, because we're almost out of time. What do we do? What should we be preparing ourselves for? Because What we should do is to uh, uh, change the paradigm. Okay? We shift the paradigm 
from the elites. That means the fight against corruption, that is what the Center for Anti-Corruption uh, Open Leadership is doing now. Shifting the paradigm from the political elite to the grassroots. It is the grassroots that should be educated, which we are educating, on how to identify corruption, how to report corruption, and how to extract corruption, corrupt people from their community. Because mm -hmm. no corrupt person, we find it easy to move around the country if we do not accommodate them in our communities. Well, we have this to go. This will help us a lot. Then there should we have be to go. I'm a so national sorry. ideology. I'm so sorry. We're out of time. I want to say thank you. Well, um, Dewa okay. Dediron is the Chairman Center for Anti-Corruption and Open Leadership, CACL. And uh, we lost connection with Kalawale Ulua Dari. He's the Deputy Director of CERAP. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for speaking with us. Thank you for having us. All right. Well, thank you all for staying with us. We'll take a quick break. And when we re return, we will be discussing the consequences of the announced possible subsidy removal and all the drama that comes with it. Stay with us.